So then we can start looking at this uh, trumpet uh, as one example of um, a product which can be, uh, be produced and <coughs> it uh, consists of uh, several sub-assemblies and components. Uh, and here we have the final trumpet, which is the end item. Which consists of two so-called sub-assemblies, and uh, this is the bell assembly, which is the main part of the trumpet, and also the valve casing, which is the three uh, parts here. So we have two sub-assemblies. One is the bell, and one is the uh, valve, uh, uh, the, the valve case. like this. And if we want to produce one final trumpet, we need one of each. But we also need to consider the time used for producing each of them. And to produce one bell, we will uh, need a total of two weeks. And to produce one valve case, we need a total of four weeks. Uh, but this valve case will also consist of several smaller components. And uh, well, this is the, uh, the valve case, which uh, needs three valves. And each of the three valves also need one particular uh, case for, for itself. So, we can say that this valve case needs two other smaller components. One is the valves. And the other is what we call the, the, the slide assembly or the slide. The case where we have the valves. So, for producing one valve case, we need three of each of these. And again, we need to look at the production time. So for the valves, we actually need three weeks for producing them. And for the slide, we need two weeks. So now we have the uh, bill of material uh, shown here as uh, uh, as this uh, figure here. The full trumpet will consist of the bell and the valve case. And the valve case will consist of three valves and three corresponding slides. And to get the total production time, we know that when we need a new trumpet, we need to plan first the bell two weeks before we need the trumpet, and then production of the valve case four weeks before we need the trumpet. And for the valve case, again, we need two weeks for the slides and three weeks for, for the valves. So in total, we need to plan this item seven weeks in advance. When we need it, we have four weeks there and three weeks there, which is the maximum of any of the, the production line, if you look at all the production line. And this is a very simple product. In uh, other products, you might have lots of different components, sub-assemblies and so on, and you need to, to make this bill of material, which will be much more complex than, than this one. Uh, but then, since we know that we need to start planning seven weeks in advance, uh, we, uh, well, still we need to look at uh, the, uh, the plan uh, or the, the forecast or the give, uh, orders which we already have. So let's now assume that we, from week number eight, start uh, looking at the demand. And we assume that here this product is uh, ordered, and uh, the, the customers will order in advance and get a date where they actually want this product. So if we start planning from week number eight, we can also continue from 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, we might know that in week number eight, we actually have a demand 
of 77. This is the orders or the forecast uh, we have for this product. It says that in week number 8 we need 77 trumpets. In week number 9 we might need 42. In week number 10, 38. And then 21. And week number 12, 26. So we we'll stop there. Uh, the example from the textbook take ten, week, 10 weeks, but we will, well, uh, it's enough here with, with uh, only five. Uh, but then, this is the actual demand. But sometimes, uh, well, th there could be inventory on stock, which says that we do not necessarily need to uh, produce 77, because we already have some items on stock. So here, in this case, we have inventory of 23 before week number 8, so we can actually subtract this. And in this example we also have what we call the adjustment which can be defined as uh, trumpets which are sold but returned from the customer and they could be uh, sent out on the market again or eventually have a very small repair and then sent back to the market. And in this case we have uh, an adjustment in week number 8 of 12 but also in week number 10 that might be uh, some uh, trumpets sold which uh, they are returned and then we need a few weeks for, of, uh, of repairment before they can send back to the market. So here we also need to adjust by six trumpets in week number 10. Uh, so the real demand will now be the, or, or the, the net demand will then be the uh, actual demand shown here but adjusted by eventually inventory on stock and also other adjustments. So here net demand will be 77 minus 23 minus 12, which is 42. And again, 42. And 38 minus 6 will be 32. 21 and 26. So this will now be the net demand of trumpets. And this is the line we actually need to look at when we should make a plan of producing trumpets. So again, we know that the trumpet consists of two sub-assemblies and of course the bells, you need only one bell per trumpet. So looking at the demand here and planning production of the bell, we just have to look at the same numbers and adjust the time period. Because we need two periods of production here, we should start producing the bells 42 in week number 6 42 in week number 7, 32 in week number 8. Just um, adjust the or, or change the time period so we will have the, the total production time. Take that into consideration. But when we are looking at the well at the well case, of course we have the same principle. We have to see the exact time period, and here we know we know four weeks. So for the Wolf case, we need 42 in week number 4, we need 42 in week number 5, 32 in week number 6, and so on. Just uh, well, replace the week number with the actual, uh, or, or subtract the production time from the week number where you actually need the final trumpet. But then, looking at the Wolves, for example, and also the slides, but the walls, uh, there you need three more times. That means that we should start producing these walls in period number one. And we need three walls per trumpet. So we can say that for this demand of 42 in week number one, we need 42 multiplied by three, 126. In week number 2, since we have a demand of 42 in week number 9, we also need 126 wolves start producing in week number 2. And week number 3, we need 32 
full trumpets. Uh, we need, of course, also 33, uh, 32 valve cases, and 32 multiplied by 3, which is 96 valves, start producing in week number 3. And similar, week number 4, 21 multiplied by 3, which is 63. And we need 78 in week number 5, because we need 7 weeks of production time for from when we start producing the valves and until we have the final, the full product, the full trumpet. So this is the way to first decompose the full product into first sub-assemblies, which uh, is defined to be the, the medium level, and then, well, there might be even smaller sub-assemblies, and there should, of course, be, it could be lots of more uh, levels here, but you can say that the sub-assembly are the medium level and the components are the, the smallest level here. So here, the sub-assemblies will consist of valves and slides, uh, the components and the full product, the assembly, the final, the <coughs> finished product, will consist of the two sub-assemblies, the bell and the valve case. So by decomposing the product this way, we will get a time and demand diagram for each component. So here we have the, in white, we have the diagram for the full trumpet and it's very easy when you only need one sub-assembly per full uh, final product. It's very easy to use the same numbers and uh, have the, uh, just uh, change the, the weak number. Uh, but when we have, w we need more components in each, uh, uh, more than one in, in each uh, sub-assembly or, uh, or assembly, we also have to, to multiply. And what is also important, this inventory and adjustments might also happen on all other levels, because you might have bells on stock, you might have bells delivered from other parts of the factory or from somewhere else. So you can just look at these demands and adjust by what you already have in inventory or what you can find from some, some other parts, um, other parts of, of the company. So this adjustment can be done for every component in, which is used in, in the full product. Uh, also important, as we saw in the previous uh, uh, PowerPoint file, uh, where you saw that one component was used in different sub-assemblies, so we have the C component used in both side, uh, sides of the, of the full product, which means that you might have two different such diagrams which you have to merge because they actually are uh, considering the, the same components. So the same components can be used in different products and also be used in different sub-assemblies in the, in the same uh, products. Uh, so, in a production factory, you have lots of such diagrams for all possible products, components, and you need to have the demand, eventual adjustment to find the net demand, and then multiply by the number of components, and also adjust by the lead time or the production time to find out which particular period you need the different components. And then you could have something like this, which is the actual uh, plan for uh, what you need of a product, and you can use the silver meal method or the least unit cost or part period balancing or eventually a linear programming formulation to find the plan of producing this particular uh, product, because it's not necessary to produce 42, 42, 32 in each particular week. That will then correspond to a lot for lot te uh, uh, technique, which is not necessarily the, the optimal one or the, the best one. It might be better to produce 82 in this week and don't produce at all here, and then 32 plus 21 plus 26 here and don't produce here. So to find a solution for the the lot sizing problem, 
uh, we can use one of the heuristics or we can eventually solve it to optimality by uh, linear programming. So that was the first part of chapter 7 and the second part is the heuristics and the, the LP formulation. So then we are finished with this topic of the curriculum and we will start on the last chapter, chapter 8. And now we are talking about operations scheduling. Um, and as mentioned, this is the, the last uh, chapter of, of the curriculum. We will first have some general theory and then look at, uh, uh, at different techniques for scheduling and different techniques. There could be different techniques which is uh, uh, optimal for different types of objective. Because here in this uh, field of uh, of inventory theory, it's not necessary uh, one objective, it's not necessary minimizing the costs, which is the main objective, but there could be, be other objectives, which is the, the main priority. <coughs> so here, different types of scheduling problems and we will mainly focus on the job shop scheduling but uh, we should also know about the others <coughs> So the job shop scheduling is uh, well, how to plan activities which is necessary to transform input to output in a production factory. Uh, well, uh, you can also say that this is a kind of sequencing of jobs. When you have a given number of jobs to be performed on one machine or one workstation or uh, or uh, eventually you can also have, have several, but we will focus on, on the one, uh, one machine situation. We should find a schedule which jobs to perform first, which second and so on. And this might be different in when you have different types of priorities. But you can also talk about personal scheduling. Uh, and this will uh, of course be at a higher level when you need to schedule how many people should you employ when should the uh, different people work to have a, a work schedule? Um, should you have overtime? How should you meet peak demand and so on? And this is the, the, uh, the, the scheduling problem of how to, um, how, how to schedule the, the personnel, how many people um, should you employ and how should they work to find a, a work schedule. Uh, you might have facilities scheduling and uh, you and me being in this room at this time is a typical facility scheduling which, which the administration of the college will have for every semester. They have to plan different classes, where should they, where and when should they be teach and who should actually teach the different uh, courses. And you can find this facility scheduling in lots of other situations, uh, operations uh, at the uh, operation room at uh, hospitals for example also need some kind of advanced facility scheduling. Who, which of the patients should be, uh, should have an operation at which time and which doctors should, uh, uh, should perform the operations. Uh, we talk about vehicle scheduling and routing, which is a huge field of, uh, of research, uh, vehicle routing problem. You have a company delivering uh, products to lots of different customers. How should they uh, how, how should they plan their uh, first? Which types of vehicles should they use? Should they use a small truck or a large truck with a trailer or so on? Uh, and how should they route all their vehicles in the, in their fleet? Which vehicles should visit which customer? And this might be a very complex uh, problem. 
uh, when you have uh, lots of uh, different uh, customers with different demands. Project management is another type of scheduling problem. Uh, then you should decompose the projects and break down to smaller tasks. And this is also uh, well, courses given, given at the master level at least. Uh, at least uh, different types of project management courses. And we talk about dynamic and static scheduling. Uh, uh, static scheduling and is when you might have all jobs available at one particular time, then you should make a static plan when to perform the different jobs. But you might have dynamic scheduling where you get information, information all the time and you have always have to update the schedules when you get uh, new information. <coughs> So, we talk about this hierarchy of the production decision. Uh, you have the logical sequence of operation in factory planning, which corresponds to sequencing of the chapters in this textbook, the NAMIAS uh, textbook. First, we start with the forecast. When we have the forecast, we can, uh, well, we have the basis for the top level or the so-called aggregate planning, which is treated in, in chapter three. And then we have the master production schedule, which is the result of the disaggregating ag aggregate uh, plan down to the individual uh, item levels. Uh, you have, based on the master production schedule, you can make an MRP to determine the size and timing of components and subassembly production, as we just saw an example on. And at last, the detailed shop floor schedules required to meet the production plan, which is resulting from the MRP. So you have the shop floor, you have the jobs, which is uh, decided by the higher levels here. So this is what we now should look at techniques for. How to put up a job shop uh, schedule at the floor. When should you produce the different types of, of orders you, you might have in your company? <coughs> and here is uh, yeah, another way to show the same. This is a picture from the, the textbook. Start at the forecast, then make an aggregate plan. Find the master production schedule and production quantities by product and time period. Make a MRP, material requirement planning system. Explode the master schedule to obtain requirements for components and the final products and then the detailed job shop schedule at the bottom when you have workers doing the actual uh, production. Meet specification of production quantities from the MRP system. Or any level here will give information to the, lever, the lower levels. So some characteristics of the job shop scheduling problem as mentioned this is the problem we will look at in this course uh, and the job shop scheduling uh, well of course the job arrival pattern will uh, uh, will matter uh, do you have the full overview the static planning that you know all the possible uh, or all the jobs within a time horizon uh, or do you get information all the time so you need to have a plan which is updated when you get new information the number and variety of machines is, of course, uh, important. There could be different types of machines uh, with different characteristics. Uh, some machines can be used to produce different products. Other machines might be specific for uh, other products or, or components. And, of course, the number of machines will decide how many production lines you can have in, in parallel. Uh, of course, the number and skill level of workers will, will also matter. You can have specialists on different uh, jobs, uh, or you can have some production where which don't need uh, particular skills, and you can assume that all, all the workers have, uh, have the equally uh, skilled. Um, so uh, we can talk about flow patterns which is the material flow, should fit to the sequence of jobs. You need to make sure that you have 
the material, raw materials, to produce what you actually need when you need it. Uh, otherwise, of course, the, the plants will not work if you don't have the, the necessary uh, raw materials or, or components. And we can also see how should we evaluate the alternative rules, which is the most important objective or what is the priority. We need to decide what is the main priority. And in this field, it's not necessary to minimize the cost or maximize the, uh, the profit because it, it is not directly uh, dependent on ho how you can have the, the income uh, uh, and, and the cost on the different rules at the, the floor in, in the factories. So here we need to decide about the objectives and one objective mentioned is the meeting the due dates. The customers could have a, a due date that they uh, expect to have the product finished or delivered and then meeting the due dates might be the main objective here, as good as possible. Uh, but as mentioned here, the objectives can be conflicting and it's al not always possible to be able to meet all the due dates or meet all, uh, all the, the requirements on the objective we have chosen. Uh, one other objective could be to minimize the work in process. Then you should be as effective as possible when you start working on a product. It should go through the different work st workstation as fast as, as possible. Minimizing the average flow time is another obje objective. Also try to finalize the jobs as soon as possible. But sometimes you have to wait with some of the, the, uh, of the jobs because they might be time consuming or, or it's not possible to uh, to finalize all the jobs within the, uh, the, the due dates and uh, uh, when they actually should, should be finished according to agreements. Uh, maximize the utilization of machines or workers could be an objective. Reduce setup time for changeovers. Uh, very often the same machine can be used for different types of production. Uh, and then changing from one product to another product could be both time consuming and uh, uh, and uh, and costly so reducing the setup time find a schedule uh, of uh, changing setup from one product to the next product to the next product which will minimize the setup time might also be one objective in these types of job shop scheduling and minimize direct production and labor cost could be another uh, objective so we will now focus on the job shop scheduling problem. And uh, here we can see the difference between the job shop and the flow shop. Because in the flow shop, you have n jobs, a given number of jobs, processed through m machines in the same sequence. Means that you start with one sequence of jobs through one machine and then follow the same sequence in the next machine. So we might have different machines or different workstations, but in the flow shop, you need to follow the same sequence. In the job shop problem, you actually have a sequencing of job through machines, which might be different. So you can have one sequence through one machine or one workstation and another sequence in the next uh, machine or, or workstation. So you might have multiple operations also on, on some machines. So this is the difference in the, between the flow shop and the job shop. And as mentioned a few times, we should focus now on the job shop problem, find a schedule, and we should also just focus on one machine. So the M, yeah, we have M jobs and M machines, and the M in our problem will be one. But we have a given number of different jobs, which should be scheduled through one machine. And then the Complexity will depend on the permissible job sequences, the operation uh, or the optimization criteria, and there could also be, be other uh, criteria. Uh, again, continuing on terminology before we start on the examples, we might have parallel processing or sequential processing, which is uh, uh, parallel. You can do 
things in parallel. You have identical machines, so you can run different production lines, produce the same on different machines. Or you might have a se sequential processing. You need to finish in one machine before you continue on, on the next uh, machine. Uh, we define the flow time of one particular job as the time from we initiate the first job in the plan, which might be today, if you start today to make a, make a, uh, to make a plan which starts today, then the flow time of one job is the number of days or number of hours before this job is finished. Uh, we define the make span as the flow time of the job completed last, which means the job in the plan which is finished last, if we make a plan of uh, five jobs, the, the make span will be the same independent of the sequence of the jobs if they take exactly the, sa the, same, uh, the same time independent of, of the sequence. Uh, we talk about the tardiness and the lateness, which is well, closely related, but the tardiness is defined to be the positive difference between the completion time and the due date. This means if a job is delayed, the tardiness is the number of hours or days this job is delayed. If not, it is zero. If a job is finished before the due date, then the tardiness will be zero. The lateness, however, can be negative. So if you're finished two days before the due date, you have a lateness of minus two, but the tardiness will be zero. But if a job is delayed, then the tardiness and the lateness will be the same. Difference between completion time and due date. But the tardiness is never negative. It will be zero if you are finished in time. And the tardiness is the measure which is most often used because, well, if you are finished early, it, it's okay, of course, the customer will be satisfied, but uh, you will probably not earn more money, uh, even if it, uh, it is finished, because you have already agreed about one due date. <coughs> so, let's now look at different rules shown here. Because now, we will assume that we have several orders should, which should be performed in one machine. And then we can look at different sequencing rules. One rule is the FCFS, first come, first serve, which is a quite fair rule because if the customer comes in a sequence, then they will have their jobs uh, uh, performed in the same sequence. And then, well, you can, uh, you can tell everyone that this is the, the fair way to do it because you, the first person come, will also be the first to be served. But this is not necessarily the most effective way of performing jobs. So we will also look at different rules. One is the shortest processing time, where you look at the processing time, you know the processing time for the different jobs, and you choose the job with the shortest processing time to be scheduled first. So try to finish the shortest jobs as soon as possible, get them out of the system, and then you wait with, with, the most, uh, with the longest jobs at the end of the sequence. And this way, this sequence will minimize the, uh, the average flow time or the total flow time uh, because you will get rid of the jobs, as, uh, of the small jobs, as soon as uh, possible. Uh, looking at the third sequencing rule here, the earliest due date, you have looking at the, the due dates and sequence the job according to the due date. This rule will minimize the maximum tardiness or the maximum lateness. It will minimize the maximum delay. So if this is the main objective, you should choose the earliest due date. And of course, all these rules, uh, if, if it is possible to meet the due dates, uh, then you, d or you don't need these rules, or because then it is possible to make a feasible plan. So all these rules are, uh, well, will uh, assume that you, you have a, a, an infeasible plan. You have 
uh, a given number of jobs which should be performed, but you are not able to to meet all the, the to perform all the jobs within the given due dates. Uh, we will also look at this CR, the so-called the critical ratio, which is the co the ratio of the processing time of the job and the remaining time until the due date. This CR value should then be used to schedule the jobs. So schedule the job with the largest CR value next. This is not optimal to any objective, but it's some kind of compromise between the SPT and the EDD rule. Uh, and we should also look at some other, yeah, some other, uh, some algorithms which is shown here first. Rule that minimizes the mean flow time of all jobs is the SPT, shortest processing time. And we can also say that the criteria, mean flow time, mean waiting time, and mean lateness will be the same. And we will look at these two algorithms here, Moore's algorithm, which will minimize the number of tardy or the number of delayed jobs. So then it doesn't really matter well, if, if a job is delayed, then it is delayed. How much, it, it doesn't really matter because we want to finalize as many jobs as possible within the given uh, time. And at last, we have the Lawler's algorithm, which will minimize the maximum flow time subject to precedence constraints. So here, we are given some precedence, which says that one job should be finished before another one can start. So these are now the different rules we will look at in, in this uh, course, and we'll go through examples. Uh, so we first start with uh, we start with the, the first come, first serve looking at the shortest processing time, the earliest due date, and the critical ratio. And then we will look at the two algorithms on the next slide, the Moore's algorithm and the Lawler's algorithm. So now let's assume that we have five different jobs. And these jobs have a given processing time and a given due date. You know how much time you will use on these jobs. And you have also a due date when the customer expects the jobs to be finished. So processing time. For job number one will be 11. Job number two, 29. Job number three, 31. And job number four and five are quite small jobs, one and two days. In total, this will be, if you sum this together, you will get 74. And this means when you have one machine, the make span will be 74. In this case, we don't, uh, we don't count, uh, account for uh, time for changing setup. So we can assume that we can perform the jobs in any sequence and the setup, we don't uh, uh, need to, to account for setup time between the different, uh, different jobs. So the make span here will be 74, which is the total number of days to finalize all these five jobs. And in addition, we have the due date. For job number one, we have a due date of 61, so the customer expect this job to be finished within 61 days. Job number two is 45, job number three, 31, job number four, 33, and job number five, 32, like this. And now we can clearly see here that this is not feasible. It's not possible to finalize all these five jobs which needs a total of 74 days and meet all the due dates here. At least one job need to be delayed. <coughs> so 
So we will now look at the different objectives and with this particular example here with these five jobs, the processing time and the due date. And before we take the break, we can just find, well, assume that we use the first come, first served strategy. We will perform the jobs in the sequence that they are given here. First come, job number one. So, F, C, F, S, one, two, three, four, five. Then the completion time Well, job number one will use 11 days. Job number two will use 20, 29 days, but we will have to wait 11 days before we start. So the completion time here will be 40. Job number three, take 31 days. Completion time after day 71. And then job number four, one day, 72. And job number five, 74. And we can see that the end, well, the, the end of the last job, 74, will then, of course, be the same as the make span. And this will be independent of sequence, since we now are only talking about one machine. And then we can also look at the tardiness. And the tardiness here. As we remember, it is zero if you are not delayed. And job number one is finished well be before time because it is expected to be finished by day 61. It is finished on day 11. So this is not tardy. Comparing 40 to 45, see that job number two is also finished within time. However, job number three is finished on day 71. It should be finished on day 31, so this is certainly delayed, 40 days delayed. Job number four, finished day 72, should be finished day 33. Total of 39. And job number five is finished 74 and should be finished 32, so it is 42 days delayed. De delayed. Uh, now we can find the sum of these columns here. And we can see that the completion time here, this is actually the same as the flow time, because the flow time is when the time from zero, when you start this plan, and until each job is finished. So the flow time for job number one is 11, flow time for job number two is 40. And if we now sum all these together, we get a total of 268. And if we sum this tardiness together, we get 121. And also, before we take the break, I will shortly show the measurement we should use to compare these, the different strategies, but we, we call talk about the mean flow time. Mean F, mean flow time, which now is 268 divided by 5, which is 53.6. Uh, and then we also talk about the average tardiness, mean or average. Not sure why they're using the different terms, but the textbook says the mean flow time and the average tardiness. And the average tardiness will then be 121 divided by 5, which is 24.2. We can also look at the number of tardy jobs. And the number of tardy jobs here is 1, 2, 3. Three jobs are delayed. And at last, the maximum tardiness. which is the highest of these numbers, which is 42. So these four measurements is what we now should use to compare the different sequences. And we have now looked at the FCFS sequence, 
and we will, after the break, look at different sequence, use the SPT, the EDD, and also the critical ratio to find other sequences which might be better according to some, but not all, of these uh, measurements. So let's take a break and meet again in 15 minutes.